interpersonal relationship types. Basically, I would like for us to think just briefly and define the, the normal relationships that we all know, such as love and you know family and workplace and online relationships. There's uh, different types of uh, or varieties or types of relationships that we engage in. So, um, first and foremost is friendship. It's a very common relationship. All of us have friends. Uh, there are certain, um, let's say, theories that have been developed around what is friendship. So, so I'm communicating with you um, this idea uh, that what friendship is based on a particular theory. It's called the theory of friendship, okay? Uh, and the, the foundation of friendship is this, is that we have a certain amount of reciprocity that needs to happen in friendship. This is what I call give and take. Reciprocity means you offer something and then you receive something in return and there's that back and forth relationship. Uh, there's receptivity, you have to be receptive to the other person in that relationship. If you simply do not respond to them, then relationship breaks down. Uh, and association. Um, association is, you know, let's say, there's these are different sort of say dynamics within a friendship relationship. Let's put it this way. No one friendship is the same. Everyone, what we define as friendship can be very loose. Um, usually in a reciprocity type friendship, okay, there's that give and take. Um, there is some, some amount of, let's say, loyalty, you know. In a reciprocal relationship, um, you can count on me. You need my help, I'll come to you. I need your help, I know I can call you, you'll come to me and help me when I need it, right? Um, there's a, so there's a degree of loyalty. There's a degree of self-sacrifice. Maybe you're saying, you know what? I don't really wanna get up early in the morning, but my friend really wants me or needs me, so I'm gonna do it. Why? Because we're friends. So I'm going to sacrifice my personal selfish desire of staying in bed a long time, you know, for my friend because he's worth it or she's worth it. And that's, that's the idea. And, uh, and there's usually relationships that are misipro of reciprocity have some mutual respect, mutual um, affection, there's generosity, you know, we go out, I buy you coffee, not because I have to, but because I want to. And next time we go out, you buy me lunch. Why? Because you want to show to me that you value me as a friend. And so there's that back and forth. Like I said, we do things for each other because we care about each other, because we want to show our friendship, our friendliness, our goodwill towards one another. So things like that. And um, then the other aspect, the, the aspect of receptivity is a little bit different. Uh, this could be a little bit of an imbalance uh, of one person giving and the other person receiving. Um, one person is the primary giver in the relationship and the other person is the primary receiver. This is when things don't work the way they should. It's the opposite of reciprocity. There may be some reciprocity going on, but not all the way. Some friends like, I need your help, I need your help, I need your help, I need your help. But when you ask them for help, they're like, I'm sorry, I can't. See what I mean? Or they may help you once, but the second time they're not going to help you. So you, things like that. There's a, always some sort of a disbalance. Uh, they come to you and say, can I borrow $100? I need $100. You know, I'm short on money. I need to pay my bill. I need $100. And you're like, okay, sure, $100. Then they give it back to you. And you come to them and say, hey, I'm short. I need $100. And they're like, no, I can't. I can't give it to you. I have it, but I can't give it. So... Like why? Why was it okay for for you for me to borrow from you, but you can't borrow from me? So like you know, why can't we have that type of relationship? And the truth is that things are not equal, okay. Uh, things like that. So whenever there's inequality in a relationship, it's not always ideal. But there's 
that type of a friendship also exists, where one gives more and the other one gives less, where one is mostly giving and the other one is mostly receiving. Not as healthy friendship, but those do exist. I mean, I've had those friendships. I've had those friendships all the time. But a lot of times people feel being used, so it doesn't really go far. Uh, and then there's uh, another friendship is the friendship of association. Now this is where you essentially say, we're not truly really friends. We're more of a, we're friendly, but we're more associates, you know? And you do things for me and I do things for you, but not because of a personal affection or anything like that, mainly because we're co-workers or something like that. You know, where we have, it's advantageous for me to do things for you and it's advantageous for you to do things for me. And that's how it is. It's not based on personal feelings, it's based on mutual interest, let's put it that way. Uh, and so that's more of an association. It's not really a true friendship. So like a lot of co-workers at work, people that work together, they're called friends, but they're not really friends. Because here's the truth, if they weren't working together, they wouldn't have a relationship. See what I mean? So they're friends because they're associated with each other. But if they weren't, if they didn't have that same job, then they probably wouldn't be friends. They wouldn't seek each other out in life to become friends or something like that. So there's different types of friendships out there, okay? Uh, and, and there are different types of love. Uh, in love relationships, uh, people who study this notion of love, um, which love is basically is a variety of an interpersonal relationship, um, in which people feel extreme closeness, in, in which people have extreme care for each other, where there's a degree of warmth and excitement, and uh, there's different types of love. There could be, you know, there could be love between friends. It doesn't have to be a romantic love always, but there's all sorts of love out there. Uh, and then what we call love, what we describe love, that, that closeness, that intimacy, that caring, can take many forms. Uh, a one that's very common that most people think about when they think of love is the erotic love, or they call it eros love, okay? Uh, this type of love seeks beauty, seeks sensuality. It focuses on physical attractiveness. I love this person because that person looks attractive to me, okay? They're, they look good. What I see, I like. Therefore, I have a feeling for that person. Now, what happens is, is when that person no longer looks that way, the love dissipates, right? It simply lessens. It can still maintain to a degree, to a level, but, or it can dissipate, unless other types of love are developed alongside of simply erotic. If it's just a simply an eros love, it's sort of surface-like. It's based on looks. It's based on attraction, okay? The other type of love that people often identify is what's called ludic love. It, it seeks entertainment and excitement. Uh, it's a game, okay? That's what it's like. It's, it's interaction, it's a game. It's supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be exciting. We do stuff together. And again, I love you because you're fun to be around. I love you because you make me feel excited, because I feel good at the moment, you know, you're interested to me and so we have this relationship, you know, but what happens when I no longer feel excited by you? When I'm, you know, then of course my love dissipates in that area. Again, this is another one type of love that can very easily quickly go away. And if it's not supplemented by other types of love, if that's the only kind of love a person can have in a relationship, then of course that's an easy one to lose. And, uh, but it doesn't have to be only one facet, okay, of love. Other types of love can develop in a relationship. Uh, let's see, uh, a storage love is a peaceful and tranquil love. This is the kind of love that a lot of people seek simply a companionship, okay? They, they, seek, um, they, they seek just to be around another person. They don't want to be alone uh, and they want to be around somebody else who understands them, who cares about them, and just kind of to do things, a partner to do things with, let's put it that way. So it's actually the opposite of 
Ludic Love. Okay, that is where in one in Ludic Love, I'm only excited. I'm only in love because I'm excited by, you know, the fun aspect of it. Here, I'm actually not seeking any fun. I'm not seeking any adventures. Here, I just want tranquility, peace. I don't want things to change. I want things to remain as they are, and then I'm good. <laughs> you know that. So it's a variety of love. Some people are gravitate towards this type of love. Um, you know more so. But the pragma love uh, or pragmatic love is a more of a practical uh, type of relationship uh, where people seek compatibility um, and a relationship in which uh, needs and desires are satisfied. Pragmatic love, okay? Uh, I know it's a tough one. Sometimes we uh, <laughs> have a hard time displaying it, but this is a very traditional type of love that a lot of people, uh, love relationship that people get engaged in. It's where you do things for me, I do things for you. It's that back and forth, uh, almost friendship, but on a deeper level, okay? Um, it's very practical. The moment I don't do things for you, or stop doing things for you, that may also end, you know? That may fall, we may fall out of that because I am focused on pragmatic aspect. You know, when you're no longer fulfilling a purpose in my life, then, well, my love can fall off, fall, fall apart, and that, so that breaks down. So another type of love. Again, like I said, neither one of these is combined, it, you know, they can be combined. It's not necessarily that you have one type and not the other type. These can be all mixed up together. But these are simply categories of types of varieties of love relationships that we have defined uh, for the purpose of being clear. Uh, manic love is another one. Now, I don't know if you experience things like this in your life experience, but this is an obsessive love, okay? This is a kind of love where a person needs constantly to receive attention and to give attention. It's like, Sometimes people develop obsessive relationships, okay? If I texted you and you didn't text me within next 15 seconds, I start thinking something's wrong. She's not in love with me anymore. That's it. We're done. It's over. Cheating on me, whatever. All kinds of crazy thoughts. So it's like I need that instant response. I am constantly one, if you don't call me every day, we don't have a relationship anymore. It's like, you got to call me every day. In fact, you know, whatever frequency of contact that a person who is experiencing manic love needs, it has to be frequent. It has to be constant. And it has to be back and forth. And if I don't get it, then I don't feel it. I don't feel that we have this love relationship. So, so some people are like that. It's called manic love. It's where you have constant attention, it has to be given and received, and if it doesn't flow, then it breaks down, okay? Maybe you've experienced something like that. Some people are like that. They're obsessive, all right? Um, agapic love is another love variety. This is more of a, a compassionate, the selfless love. Again, this is, can be compared a lot to friendship, where you care about another person and you do things for them just because. Uh, it's where you don't really care so much about receiving. Uh, you give just to give because what that person means to you. Uh, so it's mo more of an altruistic love, more of a uh, love based on a principle rather than a pragmatic relationship or how you feel. It's not about how you feel per se. It's just that the feelings you have for the person drive um, how you act versus even if that person doesn't feel back the same feelings, you still feel your feeling is just as real for them. So it's a more selfless love, let's put it that way. It's a love that thinks a lot more about the other person. Uh, so it's called agapic love um, in some ways. So there's a lot of different varieties of love. These are the main ones that the textbook articulates for you. So hopefully that makes sense. As I said, in a relationship that is described by the word love, it doesn't have to be that you have one and not the other type. You may actually have all of these types to a degree mixed in all together and jumbled up. 
So it's almost like a milkshake, you know, putting it all together like a fruit smoothie, you know, and then it's kind of like that. And with different people, however, there are different tendencies to be heavier on that type and less on that type. And that has to do a lot of with our, with our personalities. It has to do with who we are a lot of times. It has to do with our maturity. It has to do with the stage of life. It has to do with culture. Lots of things contribute why you might experience one type of love more than and the other one less so but that is this what this complicated relationship that we call love it's not that easy so just like friendship has different types and varieties and aspects so can love have different types and varieties of aspects of relationship now you would see how your communication would change somewhat between friendship and love Love is a much deeper relationship, much more intimate, much more close, emotionally, way more taxing a lot of times, okay? And friendship can be less physical where love a lot of times is much more physical because it brings in the attractiveness and sensuality and, you know, and sex and things like that. So all sorts of uh, aspects with romantic love that exist basically that don't exist necessarily with friendship, okay? So, uh, so those are our aspects of love. Now, uh, there's also uh, family relationships. And uh, family relationships are another uh, area of our life that are quite important, like friendships. We all have them, right? Uh, families are central to our life. We can't live without them. Uh, if you don't have a family, a lot of times you're at a disadvantage. Why? Because families provide us support. They provide us help. I mean, just think about I always think about, you know, what, is it, what, what would he like to grow up without family? You know, without having somebody who is a parent, who takes care of you, who helps you out, who loves you, who assures you, who teaches you how to do stuff. Like, what if I had to learn how to eat with a spoon all by myself? Would I even learn? Unless somebody taught me, unless somebody that played that role for me. You know, what if I had to learn how to do everything by myself and for myself? Families teach us so much. They guide us. They help us. They they help us with the most initial you know stages you know of, of our life. So that, that's a big deal. So uh, it is a primary relationship for us um, because it it really is functional to our life. Most of us enter life in that relationship. Uh, so some people, unfortunately. Things don't happen that way, and that it is a big disadvantage for them not to have this type of relationship. Now, the three basic uh, types of this uh, uh, family relationships: there's traditional couples, there's interdependence, and there's separates. Again, I'm speaking about a Western culture, and I'm speaking about modernity. I'm speaking about non necessarily non-traditional ways. If you come from a traditional way of life, uh, monogamous relationships traditional couples, you know, kind of set for life, then maybe some of this makes no sense to you at all. But there are plenty of people out there who live in these types of relationships, and you may not necessarily embrace them, but at least you can know about them, okay? So the traditional couples, we understand, uh, you basically have a couple, uh, usually a man and a woman, who share basic beliefs about life, system, philosophy of life, how to get things done, and so you kind of have couples, and then of course those couples have children and grandchildren and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, the interdependents are some people who form family units. By the way, family doesn't mean marriage, okay? There's lots of people who are families who are not married to each other. They may live in their relationship with each other and never get married because that's not important to them. You know, marriage is a cultural value that people embrace but some cultures don't have that same value and it's kind of strange for us to think that they may not if we never think about it but but there's plenty of cultures that don't have that or what they call marriage is completely different to what we call marriage you know so but a family is something that everybody has and it's essentially is a committed relationship of some sort so interdependence tend to stress their individuality in relationship where you're going to have people who almost like roommates and they depend on each other for a lot of things and they have a level of commitment but 
they may not share beliefs on everything. They may not share a philosophy of life. They just choose to coexist and share their expenses and you know share share parts of their life together. But so in a sense, they stay much more individualistic. Okay, and then there's another fa fascinating aspects of culture that you may may or may not be familiar with, and it's called separates. Uh, there's where people live together. Okay, uh, but they also view their relationship more as a matter of a convenience, uh, and so it's a uh, rather than rather than uh, you know it's a result of their mutual love and closeness, but it's not necessarily uh, they see themselves separate. They see themselves very dependent, and they choose to associate with the other person, but it's only because it serves them well. It's a much more pragmatic way. I can love you and I can live in my apartment and you can love me and you can live in your apartment or we can come and live together and make life easier for each other so we don't have to spend time traveling back and forth because we have that relationship anyway. So it's purely pragmatic. It's not that we must live together. It's that we choose to because it works for us. It's easier. Uh, but we could just as easily live in separate apartments and go on our love and continue loving each other and even have children together and form a family, right? Do things together, you know, buy a vacation house maybe together or something like that. It doesn't matter, you know, we are still as committed to each other. We just choose not to live what people call traditional uh, marriage life, traditional couple lifestyle. So the lifestyles can vary quite a bit from one family dynamic to another family dynamic. Why? Because while family is universal, the idea of marriage and what marriage looks like is not universal. It differs from culture to culture, from one people group to another, from one continent to another, from one religion to another. So it that that much you know differs uh, very much so, and that's the idea. So there's different types of family relationships that I simply want you to be uh, familiar with, and and that's you know uh, an important hard to understand if you are surrounded by people who are not like you uh, living in a diverse society. Um, so um, like couples, families can also grow dissatisfied with each other. So couples have this love relationship, right? We talked about the stages of relationship and they work it out. If they have deterioration in relationship, they work it out. Similar thing can happen in family relationships. You can have conflicts and issues that may cause certain deterioration. So there's a uh, conformity orientation that exists in some families. That means that uh, that usually refers to a degree to which uh, members can express similar to similar attitudes or values. Some families do not let you have dissenting ideas. Like this is who we are, this is what we believe, and you have to be in agreement. That's it. You know, some families don't let you stray outside of. Conformity. They basically say conform or you don't belong, you know, and most people of course don't want to not belong to their family So they stay they conform they choose to go with the flow, right? Uh, some are more conversation uh, Oriented and that refers to a degree to which families can speak their mind How much can you talk in your family? Can you really say what you think? You know is the question and will saying what you think be accepted or will there be repercussions because you might not be conforming with what let's say the patriarch thinks let's say dad thinks a certain way and if you think a different way and you say it that might reflect badly upon you now and now you're gonna to have to have a price to pay for that because you're not conforming all of a sudden to the family thing and the family think is in a patriarchal society it's whatever father or the grandfather thinks right boom so Depending on the structure of the family, you may have sort of say certain amount of conformity, then you can have certain amount of differences of opinion and conversation. You can have people who disagree with each other and still be okay. In other societies, not okay. There's a disagreement is not embraced. Uh, so these things. And, uh, and with these, there are some other dimensions in mind that can identify four types of families. There are some families that are uh, consensual families, some are protective, some are pluralistic, and some is what they call laissez-faire families. Again, terminology might, might be a new one for you, so let me outline this this way. Um, 
consensual families usually have a lot of conversation. Uh, uh, they may they, they they talk back and forth things out, but they also con high on uh, conforming to one another. They they believe in you know sticking together, encourage communication, but seek agreement. Okay, that's uh, consensual families. Protective families are high in conformity and low in communication. Okay, that means. They're more about protecting who they are, and they're not really interested to discuss any alternatives. So, where the consensual finds a common ground, conformity says, conformity-based family says, this is it, and this is the common ground, and you stick to it. You know? So while others find it, the other ones don't need to find it because somebody, somebody in the family already established it. You don't need to look for it. There's no discussion that needs to happen of what we should do. You know, uh, like for example, in my family, I'll give you an example out of life. So, uh, I, for example, in my family, you know, uh, for a lot of years, kids are little, I pick a place where we go on vacation. Me and my wife talk about it, this is where we go for vacation, right? Why? Because we decide, because they're too little to decide. Now that they're growing up, I ask them, hey kids, where do you want to go for vacation? And they say, oh, well, what are our options? I say, well, we can do this, we can do that, we can do this, we can do that. And now they choose. Now they may say, I want to go to Hawaii, right? And I will say, I can't afford going to Hawaii. Sorry, it's not going to happen. Too far, too much money, uh, I just can't, can't swing it. You know, so how about we go to Florida instead? And they'll say, okay. <laughs> yeah. Or somewhere, you know, some will say, let's do a cruise. So there's a lot of options. And so in my family, you know, we happen to be more of a consensual family. We will work things out. And I try to include my kids. Now I could say, you know, put my fist in and say, we're going on the cruise. Why? Because I want to go on a cruise. And that's it. I don't like anything else. That's where I want to go. Done. Or we're going skiing. And everybody's going to say, I don't like skiing. Well, too bad. We're going skiing. Why? Well, because I'm in charge. And I said so. And I'm paying for it. You know, you want to pay for your own vacation. You do whatever you want. So I'm paying for it, you're going skiing. You see, I, we can be a protective family where I'm saying, we have always gone skiing. We've gone skiing for seven years in a row. Guess what? We're going skiing. And I can just protect that turf and say, this is who we are. That's what we do. As a family, we go skiing every year. Or I can say, what do you guys want to do? You want to go to the beach? Okay, let's go to the beach. Let's work it out. Let's figure it out. Like, if everybody wants to go to the beach and I'm the only person who wants to ski, guess what? Most likely we're gonna to go to the beach, why? Because I would want to make everyone happy in my family versus me remain happy and everybody else being unhappy. What would that do for me, right? So there's different types of families. Um, protective families tend to conform to whatever the rules are and not talk much about and avoid conflict and just stay, go with the flow, whatever the boss says, basically, okay? Which is usually the dad, right? And, and consensual families talk more and decide things and find some sort of an agreement. Uh, pluralistic families are very low in conformity and very high in conversation. A pluralistic family really encourage uh, for people to express themselves much more and be more of their own individuals. You know what? We're not going to have a family vacation. I'm going to go here, and you're going to go there, and you're going to go there, and if you don't want to go on vacation, you can stay home and play computer games all day long. So, like, well, whatever, you can go stay with Grandpa. <laughs> it's like, we're pluralistic, you know. You don't want to be with us, you don't have to. Kind of, kind of a family. Where we're letting people's individuality to guide their decision making, and we're not really big on making you conform, okay? Conformity is not important. So. Uh, in pluralistic families, that's where, you know, people are supportive of each other and let each other do what they want to do in a respectful way because they don't want to violate their individual uh, desires and liberties. So, the laissez-faire family is another interesting one dynamic. Very low in conformity and low in conversation. Meaning we don't even talk about what we want to do. We don't make you do anything, and we don't talk about what we should do or should not do. Uh, we actually don't even talk much at all. 
We just kind of coexist in the same space and everyone does whatever they want to do. And we don't talk about it. I don't try to make you live my life and you don't ask me for anything. Done. You do your thing, I do my thing, and we don't need to discuss it, why we do different things. We just do. Again, some families are like that. You may be smiling at me and saying, that, that's a weird family, I, I can't imagine that. But some families are like that. Nothing wrong with it. This is how they choose to organize their family life. This, this is their culture, this is their way. So, uh, families, now, work relationships. Yet another aspect. Uh, workplace relationships can be, you know, uh, tricky. Um, most of the work relationships will fall into a variety of networking or mentoring. So networking is when each one of us possess equal skills and we share those skills and solve problems and work together to make, you know, a company or our business work well, right? We call networking. You know, you have a skill, I have a skill, we put it together, we make something of it. And together we augment each other. We're stronger because we both do that. Mentoring is another relationship. In a mentoring relationship, you have one person who is more experienced, he's the mentor, and you have another person who is less experienced, he's the protege. He is the person who is receiving some mentoring or training in that relationship. So you have one person who really knows what they're doing, and the other person who is learning how to do that. So that's another relationship, uh, you know, in, in a workplace. Some people are experts, other people's are not. And, and, and that automatically places them in that type of, of a relationship. Okay. A common relationship that occurs in a workplace is called a workplace romance. Now, that's another complicated thing. She's smiling. <laughs> She's like, I know all about that. If you guys watch TV, then you know, a lot of those TV shows are about workplace romance, right? What happens at work? Well, it makes sense. Think about it. People hang out with each other all the time. They spend a lot of time together. They already you know, work in the same industry, so something's gonna happen. Relationships will happen in a workplace. And sometimes they're romantic relationships. People develop uh, affinity for each other, uh, find each other attractive. So um, work uh, place relationships could be good, could be bad, okay? Uh, it seems like it's a good place to develop a romantic relationship in workplace, why? Because you are around people all the time and you get to test them out. You get to kind of figure people out because you watch them all the time. So you think that you could find somebody good because you could see them in different situations at work all the time, sometimes under pressure and things like that. But then there's the downside, and the downside is that they have uh, you know, uh, problems associated with it, uh, especially with management. On, the, uh, on one side, you can have you can be happy about coming to work because you're coming to see a person you want to see. And think about it, if you're in a romantic relationship at work, you want to get to work, right? Because <laughs> you're happy to be at work, because you're wanting to see that person. Now on the other side, let's say I'm, a, I'm your boss and I have to give out promotions. And I give out promotion to you, but not to your love interest. And you become the boss in that relationship. You become the manager. And now you have to manage your love interest. You see what I'm saying? That's gonna break down that relationship, right? Or how about I ask you to move, get a different job and go to a different building because I promote you. Uh, and, and now you have to leave. Well, I can't leave because I have this love relationship with this person at work. Now I can't go work across the street in a different building or I can't go move across the country you know, if it's a big company that has multiple offices, I really need you over there in Houston. You know, like, I can't go to Houston, I need to be in Atlanta. Why? Because in this office I have a romance. I don't want to leave my romance. So you see how on one side there's good things, and on the other side there's, it's a problematic. All, all sorts of things uh, uh, that can go wrong. Other people, think about other people who are not in a romantic relationship at workplace. They may feel very weird and strange that you have a romantic relationship in the workplace because you will be treating that person in whom you're in a relationship romantically with differently than from other people. And that's not fair. And they're gonna say, well, that's, I'm glad they figured this out, but this is not working for me. Uh, so all, all, this, all sorts of breakdowns can happen in a workplace romance, okay? 
And then there's other uh, relationships that are more negative that happens in a in workplace. Uh, bullying. Uh, bullying, uh, it could be done by a person or a group where people basically gang, gang up on somebody and mistreat them, uh, put pressure upon them, speak negatively about them. Uh, one variety of bullying is very common today is called cyberbullying, where people do this through um, electronic media, where they post unflattering pictures of other people and laugh about them and discuss about them online and things like that. So and then that person finds that out and they feel terrible. You know why? Because they're being talked about online by a whole bunch of people. They've been embarrassed very publicly. It's out there for the whole internet to see. It it cyberbullying has led to a lot of people, you know, feeling deep, deep sense of shame and embarrassment to the degree of people have committed suicide. So it's it's a it's a big problem. Not to say that regular bullying is not. <laughs> you know, regular bullying can lead to that as well. Uh, you know, there's lots of people who are emotionally scarred by other people threatening them and, you know, pushing them to do things they don't want to do, you know, just being abusive. abusive. Bullying can happen in a family. It can happen in the office. It can happen at school. It can happen anywhere uh, in, in any type of, uh, type of relationship. You know, uh, of course, many relationships, a family is not really a consensual relationship. You're part of a family. You're born into it, right? But like friendship. If bullying occurs in friendship, you can get out. At work, it's harder to get out because you have to find a different job if you want to escape bullying and you don't want to be around it. So it's, it's a complicated uh, aspect of uh, a relationship. All right, uh, another one, another type of relationship that I wanted to highlight for you guys is called online-only relationship. This is, again, something that is more modern. <laughs> Didn't exist uh, a few years back, but today it's possible. Online only relationship uh, exists between people who follow each other uh, on Twitter or Instagram or whatever uh, social media that may be. Uh, it could exist between a blogger and a reader of a blog. Uh, and it could be different friends and contacts on Facebook or LinkedIn or anywhere else. For whatever social network that's internet based where people are brought together into a relationship with somebody else. They don't really know that person in real life, okay? It's a very strange relationship because they've never met each other. They know how each other looks only by the pictures they post, which may not be even real or true, right? Uh, and um, they don't really have a tangible relationship. They have this electronic relationship that goes back and forth. It's real. Relationship is real. The emotions become real. The attachments become real. They, they can have affinities, they can have similar beliefs and philosophy of life and all sorts of things. They have similar likes and dislikes. They can feel very strongly about the same topics. And that relationship can grow, actually, and develop online completely without actually having, ever having to meet. Yet, uh, it's, they're also separate. They can be separated by, by time, time zones and great spaces and distances. And so, relationships that are online only exist in our world today which is a whole new dynamic you know and so when we speak about communications this is not yet another area that is just being developed and explored right now uh, communication scientists are working busily trying to articulate how communication and relationships change and based on this type of engagement with people you know and, and so it's fascinating to think about and we have developed yet one more type of relationships in just recent uh, days with uh, computer technology. So who knows what's next, right? All right, um, how are we doing on time there? I'm looking, all right, we got, a, we got a couple more minutes. I'm just trying to kind of, you know, race you through the chapter here. Um, here's some examples of, of uh, interpersonal relationships, like tw uh, some people have Twitter relationships. Anyone, do you guys use Twitter? Anybody uses Twitter? Is that a thing? No, not a thing anymore. Some people use Twitter, some people don't. Yeah, I find out that a lot of people in the younger generations do not use Twitter. They just don't like it, don't, don't care. It just doesn't appeal to them. I don't know why. It just could be a generational thing. Some people of older generations that do like Twitter. I don't know why it appeals to them, but they do. So that's why I'm asking. Some of you use it, some of you don't use it. A lot of business, a lot of companies like to use Twitter. Okay, 
it's a very effective way for them to communicate. Uh, but uh, private individuals might not care about Twitter. Political campaigns love to use Twitter, you know, things like that. So it just appeals to some businesses and some people, it doesn't appeal to others. Otherwise, more, uh, so let, just, let, just, for the, just for the fun of it, a little survey. What is the type of social media platform you guys love? Just tell me, just your personal preference. What's your favorite? If you have to pick three, which ones you can say, I can't have any more except these three. What would you, which ones would you pick? Facebook. Facebook, you like Facebook? What would be a second one? Instagram. Instagram is your second one. It's funny, both of them are owned by the same company. Okay, uh, you have a third one, maybe, that you don't like as much, but maybe kind of sort of okay? That's it? That's it? How about you guys? Instagram. Instagram is your number one. Anybody use a Snapchat? No? No, I don't want to use a Snapchat. Anybody else? What, what, what do you like? No? You don't do, you don't do social media? Yeah. No, not your thing. Okay, that's all right. Well, okay, what about you? See you on. I'm using WhatsApp and Snapchat. Snapchat and WhatsApp. And Facebook. And Facebook. All right. So, so in that order, right? So that's your favorite. WhatsApp, Snapchat, takes over. You are. That's, that's cool. That's cool. All right, what about you? What do you like? YouTube. YouTube. All right, a new one. YouTube. She loves YouTube. That's awesome. I like YouTube, too. I think it's... My my uh, my twelve year old is obsessed with YouTube. That's all he ever wants to do is YouTube. It's crazy, man. That, that's his favorite too. Uh, except I don't let him on some of, some of the other ones. Oh, what's your favorite? You? I only use Instagram. Instagram is your only one. Okay, that's cool. I like it. You're like, I I have one love, and my one love is Instagram and nothing else. That's cool. So different people use different ones. But again, you get the idea. So whatever we talk about, if we talk about Twitter, some of the rules are the same because social media are, are very similar. You know, you have connect, connections with people, you have followers, you have comments, you have, I mean, anybody blogs by any chance? Any bloggers? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes you blog? Yeah, blog. Okay, that's cool. Because Instagram is kind of kind of like a blog, but not really, you know, so like a picture <laughs> blog, right? <laughs> but uh, I blog a lot, so I actually write all the time. For, you know, for my work, I constantly write, 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 write. So I'm getting more into video these days, but I, I do I do that a lot. So, uh, and that's a very interesting way of communication with people because you can really express yourself uh, in a major way. So, um, so they give us some some good uh, guidelines in the textbook, but for some suggestions for tweeting. <laughs> this is funny, and then suggestions for blogging. Now, these suggestions that they give you are essentially are based on rules of communication and kind of etiquette and kind of like to do what to do, what not to do. Because believe it or not, in a social media world, in an internet world, the rules of communication that we engage with each other in society apply. They change. Their form changes. Their shape changes. Uh, the content changes. But some of the same rules that we would engage each other in real life actually do apply. So... Um, Things like that. So in blogging, it says offer syndication. So I mean, let, let people grab your blog and show on their blog. You know, things like that. That's a cool thing to do. Uh, using the same style, same format. You know, kind of having uniform blogs. Some blogs that I visit, they look, look really cohesive. Everything looks the same. Everything looks very professionally done. And so other blogs that come into it are like, what just happened? It looks like a teenager's messy room. <laughs> you know, because everything is different. So uh, um, anyway, it's interesting how um, you know uh, if you run a blog or, or run a uh, run a channel of some sort like a YouTube channel, you are you have to reply to comments. If people leave comments, you must reply. If you don't reply, you're basically telling your visitors, I don't care about you. I don't want to have a relationship with you. I just put that stuff out just for the heck of it. I don't care if anybody watches it you know, or, or sees it or reads it or anything like that. So there's etiquette. There's a relationship just like me. Making small talk by a vending machine. You know, if a person doesn't respond to me, then that relationship doesn't happen. So you got, you still have the same conventions uh, in, in an internet world, just as you would anywhere else. So, so there's some good, uh, um, good suggestions here on uh, on social interaction between uh, different um, networking opportunities online. And that pretty much uh, brings our, our chapter to a close. There's one more section that I ran out of time on, and, and, and that's explaining the fears of attraction. So you guys are going to have to read that one over yourself. I simply ran out of time on that one. 
but I think it's fairly, fairly short and fairly simple section in the textbook. Okay, so I'm not going to have time on that. All right, so with that, let's adjourn our class because you guys will have to run pretty soon to chapel anyway. Okay, so be well. Take care. Thank you for coming to class. Thank you. I promise I'm going to get your quizzes graded. I just had a crazy, crazy week, but I'll get it done. And I've already posted the uh, PowerPoints for chapters 7, 8, 9, 10. So you're good. You're supplied until at least 10. And I'll do the rest later. Okay. I didn't know that you were using them. So I'm glad to hear that you're using them. So we'll do that. So uh, uh, have fun. Enjoy life. Uh, enjoy school. All right. Enjoy your classmates. Professor, next week is midterm? Um, let me see what I have planned for your midterm. Uh, my online notes say midterm, but I might have done that for our online class. I'm not sure if I want to have it in our regular class. I mean, it's, when I normally do midterms in a hundred level class, I don't typically do like midterms and final exams. I honestly just give you regular quizzes. I mean, it, we may call it midterm, but it's not anything special. You know, the difference between a midterm and a final exam is more comprehensive. So let me just glance at my syllabus and I'll to answer your question um, better. Let's see what I planned here. Okay. All right, so what I planned was re uh, reviewing chapters one through eight. So always go by the syllabus. So I'm looking at my syllabus right now, and what I plan so far for the course is review chapters one through eight. That means the previous things that we've talked about, don't stress out about. Because if you're in class, you're paying attention, you're tracking with me, the quizzes you've done, a lot of it's gonna be the same, along the same lines, okay? And uh, if you want me to give you a little bit of review, I can, uh, but don't stress out about it. Because basically the midterm is not gonna be any more complicated than an average quiz. Okay, there's not going to be a lot of essay questions where you have to write stuff. It's like true, false, multiple choice. Same stuff. Okay? So while it's called midterm, it's really any, not any more challenging than the regular quiz. Okay? So don't stress out about it. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to do chapters 1 through 8. So we, we're going to cover chapter 8 in class, you know, and then kind of run over everything that we have been studying so far this semester in a very selective way. I'm only going to ask you really key and the most important things that I feel like you should know. And it's not going to be, you know, that much more complicated, just across many more chapters. Is that, are you guys stressed about it? That, that's stressing anybody? Like the word midterm? Because don't, don't be, it's not a big deal, okay? Like in some classes, if you get me in a 300 or 400 level class, when I say midterm, now it's serious, okay? Because I'll ask you for essay questions and there'll be more, more of a cumulative learning that's much deeper. I may, may make you think outside of the textbook, let's put it that way. Where in this class, we pretty much go by what the, what's in the text. All right? Yeah. So 100 level class is very different from a three or 400 level class, let's put it that way. So don't be too stressed out. Okay. I'm glad you asked the question now. So, so because uh, I because I forgot what I planned. <laughs> I, I a lot of times what you guys have to realize is I write these classes and I write these content and I prepare for everything way ahead of time. I mean I could have done this like all last year and stuff like that. And now I'm coming back to this material, but it, I've already worked it over uh, a while a while ago. We just so, just skip. The if you, you want to skip it, is that what you would like to do? We'll, we'll see about it. If you guys start talking in class, I might actually let you skip tests. But you're so quiet, so I have no idea what's going on in your minds. I don't know if you know anything or don't know anything. So the only reason, the only way I can measure, you realize what, what, what is a test? A test is a way for me measuring your knowledge. If you don't volunteer your knowledge, then I have to force it out of you by making you take a quiz. I need to assess your knowledge. Are you getting it or are you not getting it? When you're talking with me in class, it gives me another way of knowing how much you're getting, how much you're not getting, you know, how well you're connecting with the material. But if you don't, I'm stuck. I need another way. And so a quiz becomes my more trusted way of verifying knowledge, essentially. Uh, 
but it's imperfect. So you know, if you if you ever score badly on a quiz, don't get discouraged because not everybody's good at it. And quizzes is not a good education of your knowledge. It simply is one way for people to uh, assess. That's all. All right. So be well. Take care, guys. Don't worry about it.